Today we are looking at the work of a truly badass philosopher who sadly doesn't get as much recognition from history as she deserves, but whose work prefigured a lot of very important ideas by other people, and she was also one of the first ever science fiction writers. Meet Margaret Cavendish. Cavendish was writing in the 17th century, when a lot of philosophers thought that bodies, or matter, and minds, or souls, were two very, very different things. And some went so far as to say that bodies and matter, which can be damaged and which change, were definitely the less impressive of the two. You might be aware that Descartes was kicking around at around this time with his theories of Cartesian dualism, which we've talked about before, but the idea that immaterial minds or souls exist and are a part of humans goes back thousands and thousands of years. And Cavendish trimmed her sails against that idea. The philosophical orthodoxy of the time was that matter couldn't think. I mean, how could matter think? It's just made of stuff, right? In order to have thinking and consciousness, you need to have a mind which is immaterial. And Cavendish said, no, that's not true. Minds are material. Matter can think. People knew when Cavendish was writing that your thoughts take place inside your head and have something to do with your brain. And Cavendish said, if that's true, then the mind can't be immaterial. Because if your mind has a location, then it must have a certain size and be a certain distance from something else and be a material thing. Only material things can have a location. So the mind can't be immaterial, at least not in the way that a Cartesian soul is immaterial. She also says that your mind can move. It goes with you. If you're in London, you can't have thoughts that are in New York. Your mind travels with you, so it must be bound to the material that you are made of. She also says your mind can cause things to happen in the material world, like it can move your material body. And if it can move matter, it must be made of matter. By the way, if you're studying Descartes in high school, then some of this might be familiar to you, because these are the standard responses to Descartes that they teach you, so don't forget to credit Margaret Cavendish for them, because she came up with them long before Locke or Hobbes did. Now, we might want to say that Cavendish is being a little simplistic here. After all, forces can move matter, and forces aren't really made of matter, and thoughts aren't really made of matter either, they're more like events. And yeah, okay, science has moved on since Cavendish's time. But she could roll with all of that. She could say, okay, I might have been wrong about minds literally being made of matter, but the point is that we don't need anything immaterial or supernatural to explain it. We can explain the workings of the material world using only matter. Her ideas were an ancestor of modern scientific materialism. She really took seriously the idea that matter can think. She says that when two billiard balls strike each other, they don't transfer motion, rather the first one communicates the plan that it's trying to achieve to the second one, passing it information, and then the second one moves itself in accordance with that plan. So her materialism was in need of Isaac Newton to come along and sort out the laws of motion. If you're very clever, you might be wondering, how does that work exactly? How does the first billiard ball pass information to the second billiard ball? What does it really mean to say that matter is thinking there? And Cavendish admits that she doesn't know. But she says, just because we don't know how it works yet, doesn't mean there's a supernatural or immaterial explanation for it. She says that people in her time don't understand how magnets work, and they don't understand how fire can burn things without actually touching them, but nobody says that there's an immaterial or supernatural explanation for that just because they don't understand it. She says, don't write her theories off just yet, because they point the way for science to come in and settle the details. Despite her materialism, Cavendish did allow that souls and ghosts and supernatural stuff might exist. She explicitly leaves open that possibility. But she says that because they're immaterial, they can never cause any ideas to arise in our material minds. So we can't really understand them or even get to know about them. She says that, yeah, they might well exist, but they are totally irrelevant to science. She was a believer in God. But for Cavendish, since God is an immaterial thing that can't cause any ideas to arise in our material mind, God can't really be known or understood or even really talked about coherently. The only way to know God, she says, is through faith. 
She anticipates the distinction between knowing through reason and knowing through faith that some thinkers still make today. And whether or not you agree that that's a worthwhile distinction to make, you have to admit it has been very influential. Interestingly, despite her real and strong faith, she didn't believe that God created the world. She thought that matter was eternal, it always existed, and it's ordered because, well, it's literally intelligent. It ordered itself. We don't need God to explain that. Nowadays, we might raise an eyebrow at the idea of matter ordering itself because it's intelligent to begin with, but we do know that complex systems can arise out of matter without any supernatural or immaterial input. See, for instance, Darwin's theory of evolution. So, she wasn't a million miles off there either. There's a lot that we could take apart in Cavendish, and we could be picky and go back and say, oh, that's not quite right, or science has changed since then, but we could do that for a lot of philosophers from her time, and someday people from the future might look back and do that same thing to us. Her work prefigures so much important stuff that other people then went on to do, and so many things begin growing in her writing that we are still harvesting the fruits of today. She is a massively important figure in the history of Western scientific and philosophical thought. And she was the Duchess of Newcastle-upon-Tyne, which is my hometown. What do you all think of Margaret Cavendish? I think she deserves a little bit more recognition from history than she gets. The next full episode will be in January, but there's going to be something here every Friday right throughout the Christmas period. Big thanks to my top patrons on Patreon this month. Intimidating Scones, DJ McIsaac, Alan Falloon, Jeffrey, Glenn Murphy, Emiliano Haynes and Horatio Cordero. Big, big extra happy holidays to all of you guys, and thank you so much. Last time we talked about the philosophy of music and asked what are songs, so let's have a look at some comments. We raised the question of whether a cover version of a song still counts as the same song, and Orn Leafson said that as long as it's recognisable, then it's still the same one. But what if you fail to recognise it, but because there's some background noise, or because you have a memory lapse? Or what if you recognise it as the same song, but you're wrong? You think, oh, this is that song I heard the other day, but actually, it's not. So, the recognition idea is nice, but we'd need to do a lot of work on the specifics and the conditions on that. Kimonsk said that according to set theory, which is the idea that the name of a song refers to the set of all of its performances, doesn't that mean that every time there's a new performance, the set changes? So, if Suffragette City refers to the set of all performances of Suffragette City, then if David Bowie plays another one, then the set has just expanded. Yeah, that is a challenge that has been put to set theory before. I think one way around that would be to say that the name refers to all performances of it at all times. So when I say Suffragette City, I'm referring to the set of all performances, both past and future. Some Woney developed set theory in a really interesting way and said maybe when I use the term Suffragette City, I'm referring to a different set of performances than somebody else might. Like if a cover version came out and everyone really likes it, but I'm a Bowie purist and I say no, only the, only the original counts and when I say Suffragette City, I'm referring to that set and when you say it, you're referring to a bigger set and there's some overlap. I think that's actually a really nuanced and detailed idea. That's a really good addition to set theory and I'd be interested to see if philosophers have taken that and run with it anywhere. But yeah, really great comment. Danny Hedron said that if artists discover songs and don't create them because they're actually these timeless, spaceless, abstract objects that always existed, as some philosophers have said they are, then should they have artistic control over them? Because Christopher Columbus discovered America, but he wasn't automatically the ruler of it because he discovered it. That's a really interesting challenge, and again, that's been put to uh, some of the philosophers who agree with musical Platonism, which is the competing theory we talked about. Some have said that the supposed dichotomy between creation and discovery should be dissolved, and that you can have creative discovery, like uh, Edward Jenner inventing the vaccine. Yes, he discovered the principles of vaccination, but he also applied some creativity to think about, okay, how can I take this and make something with it? So maybe... Uh, we could say that discovering music is an act of creative discovery and therefore you still get control of it. Clock 442 brought up Einstein's theory of relativity with a similar argument. Yeah, you're right, that could be an example of creative discovery. And uh, the idea of creative discovery in mathematics, in particular Newton's laws of motion, was raised by Zzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
Uh, I don't know. I mean, when genes are passed on, there, there is an actual molecule that is copied. So I think we'd have to say more about what it is that's shared, what exactly the meme is, what are memes. We'd need to do more about that. And uh, I'm not saying that's impossible, but we'd have to go quite deep into meme theory, and that's that's not something I know a lot about, certainly. Um, is this memes? Is this memes? I don't know. Maybe it is. That's all the time we've got this week. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode. Happy holidays. Bye!